909 in studio is brought to you by 90.9 the bridge in kansas city to find out how you can become a sustaining member or to donate go to bridge 909.org you know this is such a, a great day for us because it's not every day you get a couple of legends in the studio michael brewer tom shipley <laughs> as michael turns around to look for the legends thanks for coming in we appreciate our pleasure. it so much. our pleasure uh one question are we supposed to take this seriously <laughs> or, <laughs> I, you can take it any way you want. Okay, to. we'll take we'll take it sur- sort of seriously. We are very uh, we're very artist friendly here, so this will go any direction you all want to take it. Well, that'd probably be uh, lots of directions at one time. <laughs> we're, we're famous for that. So, congratulations, fifty years. I'm assuming it probably doesn't feel like it. Time flies when you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> that would be us. Yeah. One, yeah, 50 years. Pretty amazing. One night you you go to sleep in a <coughs> funky little uh, room in Cleveland, Ohio, and the next thing you know, uh, here we are on, in Kansas City on television, on yeah. radio. So you tell me. Yeah. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the show tonight celebrating 50 years is at the Uptown Theater and some, some other artists that we dearly love. The Nace Brothers doing an acoustic set and Walking Horse Tim Porter, of course, Bob from the Rainmakers, who you actually have worked with. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We know those guys. So uh, it's going to be a great evening. And oh, f- really great because our old guitar player, uh, Larry Knight, is coming up from Nashville. And for any of you real old timers, uh, White Eyes. Yeah, you remember exactly. White Eyes? He was a guitar player with White Eyes, so uh, which actually I think predates Brewer and Shipley. So uh, Gator, Larry Knight, he's coming up. He was in our band for a long time, so yeah. it'll be fun. So Tom, you invoked um, Ohio. Michael, you're from Oklahoma, but you guys actually met originally. Uh, you were both on the the coffee house we circuit. We were folkies. Yeah, yes. we met in Kent, Ohio, at a club called the Blind Owl Coffee House. It, you know, it, when I was doing the research, it made me really nostalgic, kind of wishing that that still existed. Well, in a way, so do I. Yeah. It, was, it was a magical time, was for me anyway, and for a lot of other people I know. The folk era was really, really pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and the people that uh, you'd run into, you know, <coughs> uh, it was really cool because uh, when you didn't have a gig and all, virtually all of the places had places for you to stay, and, you know, if you came in a, a week early, they'd put you up. Or if you wanted to stay a week later, uh, they'd put you up. If not, you were homeless. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you had some, some, sometimes I even had to go back and stay with my parents for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there were Indian reservations and uh, federal and state campgrounds and stuff like that. So uh, we just, the folk circuit, everybody was kind of wandering. But everybody, we're talking about David Crosby and, you know, all the people that became famous there uh, when folk rock reared its ugly head. And... Uh, yeah, it made for a real special time. You know, the, there's an, I should have I should have gone back and tried to figure out who to attribute this to. Uh, I lost the authorship on this article when I was doing the research, but there was a a quote in there that I thought between the the folk stuff that you did and then the relentless touring later on, it was just so appropriate. They said that Brewer and Shipley are the musical equivalent of Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy. And I thought, that's that's pretty good. Who that's said pretty that? close. I, I've lost the attribute. Uh, I, I, I'll have to go back and look that up. Well, um, but that's, that's an honor. Yeah, yeah that I we don't know if it's be, true. Or not. I've, read the, I've read the book, so uh, yeah, it was pretty close yeah. to, to being true. You know? Yeah, I, I've thrown away so much good research trying to get this down to a manageable level. And I feel like I'm rushing through things, but uh, after you guys had met on the coffee cir- uh, circuit, you reconnected in L.A., and particularly as staff writers at A&M. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah, A&M Records was a brand new label at the time, and... Uh, yeah, like you said, you know, we met on the folk circuit, and then Tom moved to L.A., and, and I was there out, out there first, and he moved around the corner from me, living next door to Jim Messina, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he was Jim a recording was engineer at the time. My next-door neighbor. And yeah. what was so cool was the fact that uh, it's not like we decided, let's, let's become staff songwriters for A&M Records. We were doing what we always did, what we did back in the folk days. Uh, guys together uh oh let's play some guitar you know so uh that's really how we started writing together there was not any big decision we were just doing what, what yeah, we, we were just doing hanging the folk days just picking. hanging out and playing you know there was a tractor out in front no not of a the... tractor it was a big big machine with a big roller on the front and fountain avenue is a street i lived on it was being widened at the time 
And there was a guy next door called, his name was Barry Friedman, and he always had musicians hanging out at his place, crashing there and rehearsing. And there was this one band, if they weren't next door, they were in my living room. Anyway, one night, Fountain Avenue was being widened, and one night, uh, Barry Friedman and uh, one of the guys of the band, Neil Young, came in and says, hey man, look what, we just stole off that thing in front of your house, we're gonna name the band this. And they held up an iron plaque that said Buffalo Springfield. It was an interesting neighborhood. Yeah. Well, the house wasn't that, wasn't that uh, the house Barry lived in? Wasn't that uh, Lenny Bruce's Lenny old Bruce's house? Lenny Bruce's old house, yeah. There were stashes everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we never found never. them all. It had been busted so many times, the police knew where more of the stashes were than we did. So you were writing songs, supposedly for other people, but I think both you all and I think A&M kind of recognized that those songs were best suited for the two of you. Well, we'd go yeah. in the studio, you know, and cut demos on the songs we were writing for them to pitch to other artists, and we did get some cuts on some of our songs. But yeah, it uh, kind of became apparent, apparent that we had a kind of a sound of our own, and they said, why don't you guys do your own songs? So that's how our first album, Down in L.A., came about, which, by the way, is finally on CD after all these years. You can get it on uh, Amazon comes with a 12-page pamphlet telling all about the recording with pictures of the musicians. We had no idea at the time. We were just literally a couple folkies. And uh, the band uh, on the record essentially was the Wrecking Crew plus uh, Leon Russell. And uh, in fact, we, we recorded about half the, half the record at Leon's house up in the, up in the hills. And we're still, huh? Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, we knew they were really good. We had no idea yeah. they were the Wrecking Crew, though, playing on everybody's hits. You know, the thing that I thought was maybe instrumental in your sound was, you know, some of the people that you ended up playing with were so different than you that it created a sound people hadn't heard before. When you're it's kind of a hybrid Butterfield, yeah, it, was, it was kind of a hybrid sound, yeah. A bunch well, of Chicago bluesers and uh, a couple of folkies. Yeah, it, we, I'll never forget when we walked into the studio uh, in San Francisco, and this was <coughs> for our second album. Because we'd left L.A., so Hollywood was, oh, they quit the business, you know. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we did three demos uh, for, uh, just for anybody. They were going to try and shop it. And Michael and I go walking in the studio. In fact, I think I was in crutches at the time. You were. It? And uh, we walk into the studio, and there's essentially the Butterfields Blues Band and uh, just, these, just these killers blues players. Well, what do you do? You know, here were a couple folkies from the Midwest, so that they they had to put a major seventh, you know, in everything because they were bluesers and we were just straight folkies, strummers, and uh, so there had to be a musical compromise somewhere along the line. And I truly believe that that's you know how that sound evolved. And nobody charged anybody for anything. You know, if if somebody down the hall was uh, well, Jerry Garcia, uh, he played. Uh, uh, Oh, mommy. Seal on the back of on yeah. oh, mommy. He didn't say how much uh, is it going to cost, or we didn't say that. He wanted to know what kind of chemistry we had going on in the studio, and that was about it. You know, uh, you know when you use the 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 name Jerry Garcia in the same sentence with chemistry, it just brings up a whole other line. It, of it does well, questions. Well, you know what? We even uh, hired people off the street. There'd be somebody down in Giardelli Square in San Francisco. You know really good uh, flautist one day. We'd walk by, this guy's really good. Hey, would you like to play, uh, play on a song? Sure. So he came into the studio and uh, played on a song called Ruby on the Morning, played a beautiful part. So yeah, we just worked with a lot of different people, whatever felt good at the time, you know? You know, I feel like I could just stay here and talk forever, but you guys have guitars in your laps and I think everybody would love Ruby. to hear you sing. I was wondering what this was. <laughs> <laughs> you want us to sing a song? Okay, <clears throat> here's a song. Actually, this is one of the first songs we wrote after coming to Kansas City. Uh, we were getting ready to go to Wisconsin to do some colleges, and it was a beautiful fall day, but winter was right around the corner, and we wrote this song called Indian Summer. <laughs> Summer's leaving 
thinking of you, thinking of you. I thought we wrote it. May, well, maybe we did. Maybe we did. I can't <laughs> maybe remember. BG should be thanking you. Could be. That was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, this is maybe the dumbest question that I've ever asked. Oh, come on. Let's hear it. Um, but your harmonies are so close and so tight and so beautiful. Do you actually know which one of you is singing lead and which one is singing harmony, or do you just have two different parts? We forgot that, a long time ago. Yeah. We don't know. I mean, is there an intention that one of them is uh, it? Uh, early on, uh, I believe so. But uh, they're songs, and the melody kind of floats all over the place. And because we do sing very tight harmonies, uh, the melody, I guess, some people think this is the melody on the same song. Somebody else thinks the other part is the melody, so we don't care. 
as long as <laughs> as long as they like the song, you know, and uh, and we don't croak or anything in the middle of it. It's uh, it's just super. You know, you mentioned the name of that first album down in L.A. and and. Uh, the meaning behind that title is you were down in L.A. Kind of yeah. hated. Yeah, we didn't we didn't like living out there. <clears throat> we missed seasons and fresh air and sunshine and actual clouds and you know. When we were living in L.A., we used to. Uh, well, we, Michael and I had both played the Vanguard in Kansas City, and uh, so once we we got together, uh, we would uh, come to Kansas City to play the Vanguard, fly out and. Uh, I remember we came out here with uh, Steve Martin, who was still working as a banjo magic act at Disneyland. And one of the things that got me, that was the old airport downtown, and got off the plane and saw clouds. And I hadn't seen clouds for, the, at that point, the two years that I'd lived in L.A. There were no clouds. The sky was just always gray. And so that is my, my memory of uh, arriving in Kansas City and leaving L.A. with seeing clouds. Smog for clouds, good trade. Yeah. So extricating yourself from L.A. is kind of funny. Uh, you know, you, your leases ran out at a different time. or uh, yeah. yeah. And so as I recall, Tom, you were camping out. In, <clears throat> I was camped in Michael's backyard as we were mixing the album. We were finishing the album. I had, I had the sense at one point when I'd gone home to Cleveland to put all of my camping gear in the car, figuring I might need it. And I did, because as we would tour over the years, you know, early on, uh, I would camp on a lot of, a lot of Indian reservations. So uh, uh, if we finished the album, my lease had run out, so I put the tent up in Michael's backyard, and that's where we finished it. And then I took off for the Hopi reservation. He was going to follow me as soon as his lease ran out, which was in a few days. Uh, it took a little longer, though, because yeah. uh, I'd gotten rid of everything in my, in my place but a mattress to sleep on. And the last thing I had to do, I had this old beat-up 1955 Volkswagen. And I had to go get some new tires, and I was on the Pasadena Freeway. Came around a bend, and all the traffic was stopped, so I had to stop quickly. And somebody in a sports car going way too fast it didn't stop and rear-ended me. And, of course, an engine is in the back of a Volkswagen. So I was there for another long time till I could finally get out of town. And then I, drove for 30-something hours straight to the Hopi Reservation to meet up with Tom. And there was a hole in the floorboard of my little Volkswagen. So by the time I got there, all the carbon monoxide had blinded me. <laughs> I couldn't keep my eyes open. I couldn't stand to blink. It was really bizarre. His and eyes looked like somebody, his eyeballs, like somebody had taken nail polish and, <laughs> and then taken their finger and did that on it. That's how funny it was. Well, it wasn't funny to him. Yeah. It looked pretty humorous. <laughs> I'm, okay. And you got there just in time for the snake dance? Yeah, snake dance, yeah. It was uh, what I saw of it. It was kind of hard to... <laughs> yeah, it was quite an experience. You guys have always had an affection and an uh, appreciation for Native culture. Absolutely. Oh, ab absolutely. Indigenous, indigenous culture is... The, especially American indigenous culture. Uh, it's, it's harder and harder to find, but it's... Uh, it's really cool, and it just affected us. Michael's from Oklahoma, and I'm from Cleveland, so I had the Indians, you know. And uh, <laughs> no, we both have, we both have been individually and together really influenced by uh, Native America, uh, Native American music, uh, just the culture, all of that. Well, You're one of your right. most popular songs is kind of lifted from Jim Pepper. Yeah, uh, and you sure made it your own. It's beautiful. Witchy Taito, yeah. Several hundred years old, peyote chant. Jim Pepper put it to music. We learned it off the radio. It's when uh, FM radio was brand new. And when we, after we moved to Kansas City and we're traveling all over the heartland <clears throat> playing schools, we'd be listening to this station out of Little Rock, Arkansas called Beaker Street, a show called Beaker Street. Clyde Clifford was the DJ. And we would just wait for him to play Witchy Taito because we just loved it. We learned it off the radio. And we got the uh, Native American part right, but we got the English part wrong <laughs> but yeah it's a great song yeah so by that time you guys are are touring pretty relentlessly and um and you know it's hard to imagine now back in the 60s but you know you guys were kind of hippies and kind of well you know long <laughs> hair and, and well, we had was, hair yeah it, it sounds silly now to to say this but 
long hair could, you know, you could get your rear end kicked. Oh, yeah. We had to pick and choose where we would stop to get gas or get something to eat. You know, we got turned away from motels and stuff. Or you were talking about Wichita Taito. Uh, Michael and I were playing a place called the Happy Warrior in Rochester, Minnesota. It wasn't happy. <laughs> what? It, it, wasn't, wasn't happy. it wasn't happy at all. And, the uh, Bummer Warrior. They, they hated us. It was just a, <clears throat> essentially a neighborhood tavern. And uh, Michael and I had learned Wichita Taito from the radio, and we're just starting to work it up. That's the only song that not only they, I'm not even sure they liked it, they didn't hate it. Yeah. And at one point, actually, uh, I was, uh, I just went to the men's room, and some guy grabbed me by the collar and slammed me up against the towel rack and said, I fought for my country. I'm saying, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Please don't hurt me. <laughs> so we, we learned, uh, we did Witchy Taito, and that was the only song that uh, we didn't get anger from, from the audience. So that's why it ended up being, what, six or eight or ten minutes Oh, long. well, we played it for 15 or 20 minutes at the we Happy Warriors. It was like a mantra, you know, just zone out to get it over with. We, tried, we were there for two weeks. We tried to get out of it. And we called our manager, and he says, oh, you got to stick it out. He called to the owner of the club. And he hated us. And just to mess with us, he says, yeah, I'll let you go if you pay me what I was going to pay you for the next week. So we were stuck. Wow. We had to just bite the bullet. And that, that sort of, you know, difficulty that you ran into in the road, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was sort of the basis of the song, Tarkio Road? Uh, it was all part of the yeah. same thing, yeah. Well, you know, I've said we were play, playing schools all over the heartland. And the main road up into... Iowa and Wisconsin and Nebraska and everything would be up through Tarkio, Missouri. What is it, I-29? Yes, I-29. But back then it was just a two-lane highway. And we also played a college in Tarkio numerous times. There was a place called the Mule Barn that we played up there also. So we just nicknamed it Tarkio Road because that's that's what we had to drive all the time. Yeah, and the the schools in Iowa and Nebraska and, and whatever, eventually you came to Tarkio to get home. And then it was essentially... I, tank of gas would get us to uh, the first gas station in St. Joe. You know, we could, we'd roll in on fumes, and, but it was a truck stop. So, you know, we'd go in there and with hair down all over the place and beads and whatever, thinking, <laughs> please, I hope they don't kill us. And uh, you'd walk in and the guys, you guys look like you ought to have zippers on the sides of your pants. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and we'd get our gas and pray that they didn't hurt us and uh, roll on into Kansas City. You know, and, you know, that, that fear of, you know, the truck stop at Tarkio and places like that. Fast forward a few years, Tarkio loves you. You sang about them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got the key to the city there a few years ago. <laughs> I've got Played it hanging there. on my wall. <laughs> You know, you, you invoked... Oh, you know, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We also, since we lived in Raytown, uh, first time we played the, the park, there was a free concert at the park, the mayor gave us this honorary certificate for proclaiming it Brewer and Shipley Day in Raytown. <laughs> Brewer and Shipley Day, and uh, I, I told the audience then that the mayor had declared it... Uh, it was a pot-free day. If you got them, smoke them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody did, but uh, what can well, I say? Well, if you uh, if you can find that and give us the day, we'll celebrate it every year. <laughs> Be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, so you in, you talked about writing a song at um, at the Vanguard, and and probably your most favorite song was actually written at the Vanguard. In Our between, most favorite? Uh, famous. Famous. Oh yeah, yeah, no doubt. In between shows. Well, Maybe actually, it, we were getting ready to go on for the last set of the evening and uh, started coming up with an idea for it. The next day, we got together, and in about an hour, turned it into a song. And uh, It wasn't a song. It was a joke. Yeah, it was writing right. something just to make our friends laugh. Yeah. We didn't even take it seriously. It, and uh, we were working on our Tarkio album at the time, flying back and forth to San Francisco and also around the country doing shows. And uh, the first time we played Carnegie Hall, we opened for Melanie, and we went over really well, got a few encores. And, ran, out of songs. Uh, ran out of songs. So we thought, well, let's do that new song. We did, and everybody loved it. And the president of the record company we were with at the time came backstage and says, oh, you got to record that and add it, add it to the album, which kind of surprised us because, like I said, we really didn't even take it seriously, so we did. And then they decided they wanted to release it as a single. But you guys didn't even know that it had been. You'd been on a fishing trip, and you came well, back, we, and it was a single. Yeah, we, were, we played at a couple uh, little colleges in uh, – in Florida, a Florida Presbyterian, and one over in Dade County, and then a uh, real good friend, uh, uh, Vince Martin, uh, was a partner for a while with, with uh, Freddie Neal, but uh, 
Vinny lived in Coconut Grove, so we went uh, to Coconut Grove and hung out with Vinny for a while. And uh, he's, in fact, he said, that song's a hit. And we looked at him, you're crazy like everybody else. Made it back, and uh, when we got back, found out that we had a hit and we were in trouble. Yeah. Which made us laugh. And, of course, we're talking about one toke over the line. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, I think... We're into triple digits now, by the way. It's not just one. (laughs) (laughs) Just saying. You know, the... I think the most ironic thing about everything that happened with one toke over the line is that it is essentially a song about moderation. It is. Absolutely. Because you were one toke over the line. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, people don't... Uh, they heard the phrase, uh, what it was, we used we, we, a street word, toke, and that's what it was all about. If anybody had have read the lyrics, it was a song warning you about excesses, you know, and uh, saying you, you need to be moderate in your life, and uh, they didn't bother reading past the first uh, sentence. <laughs> You know, I don't know if there's any way that the Guinness Book can put this in there, but I'm just pretty sure that you may be the only songwriters that have ever been covered virtually simultaneously <laughs> by the Grateful Dead and Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Welk, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. We were in London at the time when Lawrence Welk performed it, and we didn't even believe it. Now, your mom saw it. My mom saw it, yeah. She, I, my brother said that... Uh, she said, she's going, no, Lawrence, no, no, Lawrence, no. <laughs> he referred to it as a modern-day spiritual. And it was gospel to us, Yeah. so what can I say? But anyway, 30 years later, uh, my lovely lady Scarlett got, a, a, got her hands on it, and we put it on YouTube for the world to see. I think it's got about a million or something hits It's now. got over a million. Yeah, it's hysterical. You know, and the, the I mean, the, it's the, the performance is from a couple people, Dale and Gail. Yep. And Gail's wearing this little frocky kind of thing with a little, <laughs> yep. like, butterfly applique. And little puppy and, sleeves. And, well, she came to see us. I was going to ask you she, about that. We were playing back east, and she and her husband uh, and her, we were playing a, a place back east, and they flew out to see us, which I found pretty strange but uh, but it was ice you know uh i i wasn't a big lawrence Welk fan so i really <laughs> wouldn't have recognized her if she had just been sitting in the audience but i thought it was cool she she came out to say hello and had dinner with him so you know lawrence Welk himself referred to it as i think one of the new spirituals yeah, yeah. or a, a modern a spirit. modern, day, modern spiritual. day spiritual um and again, you didn't have any problem with that. You felt the same way, but completely different lens that you were looking through. Um, but somebody, somebody at that production company had to know. I, yeah, oh, yeah, the think. band knew. Yeah, the people in the band knew. The yeah. band always knows. Yeah. Yeah, I know some of the, uh, uh, the Lennon brothers, the kids of the Lennon sisters who were on the show, and they grew up on the set. And I asked him one time, did anybody have a clue? And he says, oh, some of the guys in the band definitely had a clue. But Mr. Welkin did not. <laughs> it was funny because when when we you know when we had the hit on it, uh, uh, the ACLU was on our case to take it to court. You know they're they're infringing on your rights and whatever. And we kept telling people it was a joke. You know uh, there's nothing serious about it. We're not going to go to court over it being banned or. Or whatever. Well, the it, FCC just, was threatening radio stations' licenses right. if they oh, played yeah. songs that had drug lyrics. And, and that list of songs... Puff the Magic Dragon, seriously? Yeah. Yeah, it was ridiculous. You know, we thought it was the equivalent of burning books. You know, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you were also named to Richard Nixon's enemies list. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Badge of honor. You know what? We miss him. We miss him we a miss lot. Him. Yeah, I want, I want Dickie We'd back. We'd have him back yeah. in a heartbeat. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Please come back, Richard. So, you know, given your history of being slammed up against the bathroom wall in Tarkio, <laughs> all of a sudden to be on Nixon's enemies list where you, like, I know that you got to the point where you thought it was funny and you largely ignored it and let it run its course. But, like, if I'm in your shoes, there's at least a moment or two of total abject paranoia. Well, we kept waiting oh, to get yeah. busted, but 
Never did. Nothing ever happened. Never got hassled by anybody. Amazing. You know, the flip side of one toke actually might have been more offensive. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I believe that's why uh, one toke was hit so hard, because the other side, oh, mommy, I ain't no commie. Uh, named him by we, personally. We named uh, Nixon personally, and uh, that's when Jerry played on. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that it was the B side, because it was pretty funny. We were, because the song one toke was doing so well, it was Armed Forces Radio. And they had uh, a lady in there, and she'd do the interviews and ask, you know, or tell what song was coming next. And then some engineer, you know, some guy probably in his 50s who didn't like our kind of music anyway, didn't know anything about it, just inserted it, and then it got played on Armed Forces Radio. And we did this thing about one toke, and, and uh, she said, uh, well, what other song do you want to play? This was during a little break, and I said... Uh, uh, just flip it over. And she said, what's the name of the song? It's Oh Mommy. <laughs> so that, that thing got heard all over Southeast Asia at the peak of the war. Oh Mommy, I Ain't No Commie. And the number of, because of it, the number of Viet Vets that are fans of ours is uh, <coughs> surprising, seeing how we were really you know, against the war in Vietnam. Uh, but the number of Viet Vets that are big fans, which it surprises me. Brewer and Shipley in our studio celebrating their 50th anniversary. They're going to be at the Uptown Theater tonight with Walking Horses and Porter and the Next Brothers. We'd love to hear another song if we could. Let's okay. do uh, Let's do Make My Bed. Do something new. Or newer. Yeah, Tom okay. and I decided uh, numerous years ago, we were on Kodiak Island, Alaska. And uh, we'd gotten screwed by every record company we'd ever worked for. So we decided to form our own company and screw ourselves. And so far, so good. Got to tune up again. And actually, uh, the album's called Shanghai, recorded in Springfield, Missouri, with some of the killer players anywhere. Uh, and uh, actually, I wish this had been the uh, follow-up album to, uh, to Tarkio Road. I think they're better songs, and uh, the players were just killer. You don't have to make my bed if you go down easy You don't have to light a fire If your heart is true Just remember what I say If you want to please me Get it through your head All the ghosts are dead you don't have to make my bed You don't have to tell a lie Or fake a feeling You don't need to be afraid If you lay it on the line Just remember what I say that would be like stealing So get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have to make my bed Get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have to make my bed I've heard you in leathers And I felt you in laces I've seen those looks that come over your faces I reached for passion in the heat of the night Did it disappear without a trace? You don't have to make my bed If you want to please me So get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have to make my bed Get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have 
have to make my bed I've heard you in leathers and I felt you in laces I've seen those looks that come over your faces I reached for passion in the heat of the night Did it disappear without a trace? You don't have to make my bed If you go down easy So get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have to make my bed Get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have to make my bed Get it through your head All the ghosts are dead You don't have to make my It'd be nice if you did make my bed, because you know, <laughs> it's usually a hovel. You know what I mean? That album <laughs> produced by the late Lou Whitney. Yes, it mm -hmm. was. Had some of the Daredevils, I think, on it. Oh, yes, some uh, of yeah. the Daredevils, and just uh, Springfield, Missouri, has an incredible just group of musicians down there. Some incredible talent. I would say, uh, oh, you take guy. Well, the late Lloyd Hicks. Lloyd just passed. Uh, but, One of my favorite drummers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, guys that are on the same level as, you know, the hotshot L.A. studio musicians. And maybe even a little bit more inventive because they don't play it safe. Yeah. You know, they're in Springfield, Missouri. What's going to happen to them? You know, where you take a Nashville musician, he's got to make sure that he you know, gets it right on the second take or he won't get the job again, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was wonderful. And, and uh, Lou is... Lou is missed by, is going to be missed forever by uh, the rock and roll community. Yeah. You know, I, just one last little thing about um, your, your trouble with the government. <laughs> uh, Spiro Tiagnu went on television and referred to you as subversives to American youth. Yep. Yes. Thank you. You, you, know, can't, you, know, you can't buy that kind of publicity. Uh, yeah. and, and that's exactly where I was going to go with this. I mean, it... What they did did have an effect. One of the guys that we work with here, Clint Brott, was working at a radio station, playing one toke over the line, got a call from the owner, don't even let the song finish, take it off now. So, I mean, it did have an effect, but, you know, the end result was publicity. And you guys, by the time you got to the other side of that, you were bigger than you'd ever been. It, it, they tried banning it, and Michael and I get booked in a club in Chicago, what was it, The Quiet Night, I think, something night. like that. And uh, we had no idea, but uh, the National Association of Broadcasters Convention was in Chicago at the same time, and one toke was getting, you know, there was all that hassle. So here comes the FCC into, uh, into the club, right? And uh, one of them, the, the head of the FCC, the guy that was really uh, trying to get us banned, uh, I, introduced, I dedicated the song to him, and oh, I love you guys. He was pretty drunk, and we might not, in all the years that we played together, learned much, but we had learned how to deal with drunks, you know, and uh, it was really, really, really funny. And then the next day, the head of uh, ABC Radio uh, had Michael and I invited us up to his office and just asked one question. He says, were you guys uh, trying to promote drugs with that song? And we said, nope, actually, it's a song about excesses. He said, we're staying on it. And then those stations that had fallen off came right back on. And it was, uh, was kind of scary, you know, actually. We, uh, it was, oh, maybe a year. It was the, the fuss was still going on, and we were doing the, the Dick Cavett show with Mike Wallace. And uh, Mike Wallace was under the gun for... Uh, his outtakes uh, for a, a piece that he did on CBS called The Selling of the Pentagon. 
and uh, he was telling me, telling Michael and I how uh, the government was trying to shut down, you know, broadcast uh, stations via their licensing uh, if they played stuff that Nixon didn't like. And uh, it, it was scary, actually. Yeah. Uh, to us, it was still a joke. Yeah. You know, the at that point, you guys were making more money and... You know, it's almost like be careful what you wish for because you might just get success. Uh, you were making money constantly on the road. and it, Too the, much on the road. Too, too yeah. much. The people that you played with, though, I mean, just there were a couple of moments in Kansas City that I'm sure you remember playing to 15,000 people at Loose Park. That was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Opening for Elton John in the first stadium show at Arrowhead. That was fun. I liked it. I looked up at the Jumbotron and realized... Uh, my my face on the screen was bigger than my entire body. And so <laughs> I thought, okay, for this instant in time, I must be cool. It passed very quickly. <laughs> it was just, you know, three seconds. But for three seconds, I was cool, you know. So I liked that a lot. You uh, you you did dates with the Eagles, with Jethro Tull, Linda Ronstadt, Ozark Mountain Daredevils, James Taylor. You played Central Park with Springsteen. Uh, but the one that really sticks out for me is... Uh, Black Sabbath with Ozzy. Oh, um, Creative booking. Yes. <laughs> is what that is. 28 cities and 28 nights opening for Jethro Tull. Insane. Crazy. Should, you know, should never have happened. That, that was all politics. And, we and didn't want to do it. Had to do it. In terms of Black Sabbath, uh, Ozzy liked riots at his shows. I mean, he really encouraged riots. So I remember Michael and I looking. We're getting ready to go on. We're looking out the window. And there were riots going on. And they have mounted police uh, there in Cleveland, and they were, the horses were smashing the kids up against the, uh, uh, the side of the building. And, and whacking that, them on their heads with their nightsticks. Yeah, and then we go on stage, and people are throwing those great big sparklers off the balcony into the audience and shooting Roman candles, you know, at the stage and that kind of stuff. And we realized that we were not in our environment. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we needed to be back at the Vanguard at 43rd and Main, you know. Yeah. <laughs> The smell of cider. You know, and you were you did a lot of TV. You did Johnny Carson, which I think you hated. Well, I can't say we hated it. It was just weird because we, first of all, he wasn't there. Joey Bishop was a guest host. That was disappointing. But we flew all the way f f out to, to New York. It was still in New York. And our bass player, John Kahn, rest his soul, he, we flew him all the way from San Francisco to be there. But they would have had to have paid him more if he was on camera so he couldn't even be on camera after telling his folks and everything, I'm going to be on Johnny Carson. So you couldn't see him. And then they didn't even have his mic turned on. So you couldn't hear him either. It was a Zen gig for John is what it was. Yeah. And for us, a lot of that, the excitement of those kinds of things, we were doing well over 200 shows, you know, and most of them were one-nighters with the exception of uh, The Bitter End uh, down in the village and uh, The Cellar Door in D.C., which would usually put those two together so we actually had, you know, two weeks where we were sort of in the same place. But, you know, it could be a big show, could be a little show, could be an important show. It was just a show for us. You know, you got there, did the sound check, hope that everything worked, and then did the show and back to the room and on to the, the next gig, which could be a big one, could be a little one. You know, one of the refrains we hear often is when you're touring so hard, it's almost impossible to write songs, too. Um, well, one of the reasons some of our albums ended up having a lot of songs about the road is because we were living on the road. There was nothing else to even think about, you know. So eventually, you, you know, you kind of got burned out and felt like you had to get off the road. Uh, my sense is that you never broke up. You just sort of stopped for a while. We just needed a break. We, yeah, we needed a break. And uh, uh, I, I met a lady and uh, decided, well, it was the night I met her, oh, cripe, she's the one. Now what am I going to do, you know? It was one of those kind of things, and we've been together uh, ever since. Congratulations. You know, 1976. But at one point then I realized I can't continue to do the road the way I had been doing it and have a relationship with this lady. So it wasn't like I quit the band. I just had to stop touring. I, I think Michael was probably the same way. Just I was fried. We were fried, and so there was nothing new. All we could do is just the old stuff, you know, and uh, – for artists, that, that can be a that can be a sad experience, actually. Right. So you you both went off and continue to do creative things, Michael. You've done I think three solo albums. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just finished a fourth last week. 
Tom was talking about the musicians in Springfield. That's where I recorded all of my solo CDs. And uh, some different players are on this one. And uh, yeah, I just finished it a few days ago. And then, um, Tom, you got into video production and have done yeah, some amazing doing, things. I started doing television and uh, working for a low-power TV station. But uh, I learned how to do television. And when the station uh, shut down, all the equipment was sitting there. So I worked out a deal where I could you know, start shooting stuff. And I ended up uh, shooting a, uh, a documentary called Treehouse about an old river rat, a guy that lived down on uh, Hoosaw Creek. And uh, while I was right, while I was uh, videotaping the story, uh, I wrote, I just wrote a song that would be, ended up being a theme music. And I got with Michael, because you know, this, this would be great in Michael's range. And I asked Michael if uh, he'd record it, or you know, he'd do it, and I played banjo on it. And a uh, guy that used to work uh, for KCPT, Steve Baker, uh, he was our bass player, and he had a little recording situation at, ho at his house, so we recorded, uh, we recorded the, the theme music for it there. And then I've been, I'm still doing television. Uh, I worked, well, I worked at uh, University, Missouri University of Science and Technology down in Rolla. And they would send me all over the place. Uh, I did their marketing video, and my favorite was uh, they would send uh, San Salvador, uh, Bolivia, Bolivia twice, uh, both to the Andes and uh, uh, down to the Amazon. And they just sent me a lot of places, so I got an opportunity to travel a lot and shoot in places that I wouldn't normally do. So, so it was a blessing. But at the same time, working at a university. I wasn't teaching, uh, I was staff. I got essentially a little over three months a year off, or yeah, yeah three months a year off. Yeah. So, and I could take them anytime because I wasn't teaching. So Michael and I were able to start touring again. You know, it was really kind of, uh, give, give credit to them, the Fox when they were celebrating their first anniversary of coming on the air. They're responsible for us get, getting together again. Yeah, they uh, they offered you a gig and mm -hmm. and the money was pretty good. So all of a sudden, you guys are back in the Brewer and Chipley business. Yeah, we got some old friends to you know old band members together and our old friends the Mountain Ozark Mountain Daredevils and it was a Starlight Theater. Yeah, it was it was fun. We, we uh, rehearsed at Michael's place down in Tulsa, outside of Tulsa, and uh, remember the trip back. In oh yes, the rain in the flood. Oh my goodness, it was Missouri was under you know. Flood warnings and whatever it was, we almost didn't make it. You, you know, know how I, close it was. I think after people have listened to you guys talk and listened to you perform, uh, they're going to want to do two things. One is go to the show tonight at the Uptown Theater, celebrating 50 years of Brewer and Shipley. Uh, but also, everybody's going to want to get some music. And most of what you've done as a duo and also individually is available on the website brewerandshipley.com. So that's a quick place to stop off. We'd love to have one more song if we could. Let's do Streets. What? Streets. Okay. We're going to do another controversial song. <laughs> we didn't think it was, but... Turns out that it is. I gotta remember where we do it. Yeah, me too. Uh, uh, we both have coals, so let's try to half step lower. I know you hate that, having to sing I'll too sing. low. But. <laughs> Maybe I can hit the high notes that way. <clears throat> Tom's had the flu not once, but twice in the past month or so. And now I've got some kind of head and chest thing going on, so we're not in the best voices. Uh, we wrote this song quite a while back. This is on our Shanghai Screw Yourself CD. <laughs> and uh, we never know these days how it's going to go over, actually, now that we live in the uh, divided states of generica. We come on this... How's it go? There we, we go. Came, that, hip. Yeah, there we go. We came on the Santa Maria and we come on the sloop John B. We keep coming cause we heard there was a place we could be free. From the shores of many nations, we're blown here by the wind. Sweet lady of the harbor, won't you kindly let us in? See so many 
many faces Coming here from so many places For a chance on the streets of America Leaving home, losing pride Some suffer, some simply die For a glance at the streets of America I'm not sure why they call it the land of the free But I know why they call it the home of the brave I see sisters and brothers Trading one heartache for another And a shot at the streets of America Those who have, they ain't given Those who don't are working for a living And forgotten on the streets of America I'm not sure why they call it the land of the free But I know why they call it the home of the brave Telling me there ain't many choices when you sleep on the streets of America. I'm not sure why they call it the land of the free, but I know why they call it the home of the brave. I'm not sure why they call it the land of the free. Streets of America. There you go. Brewer and Shipley. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you all coming in here today and, and spending the time with us and sharing what you do. It's just, it's such a gift to us. And well, well, thank, thank you. you. Kansas City has been such a gift to us over the years. It's the least we can do. We love Kansas City. Well, the mutual love, um, you know, and appreciation takes full flower tonight at the Uptown Theater, celebrating 50 years of Brewer and Shipley, Walking Horse and Porter, the Nace Brothers there as well. So make sure and make it by the Uptown Theater tonight. And again, if you'd like to catch up on your Brewer and Shipley collection, there's a lot of great stuff available at BrewerandShipley.com. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank Our you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Brewer and Shipley on the bridge.